Hi, Year 12, and welcome, welcome to this flipped learning lecture on the structure and role of um, the different parts of the British Parliament. Here's a list of some of the concepts that we've been looking at in class, um, although you should spot a few new ones here. Um, so please can you pause this lecture at this point and make sure you've recorded the definitions for each of these concepts because these are very key for both this lecture and actually the whole of the politics topic this year. This is a, just a quick copy of what you should have in front of you, hopefully blown up into A3. Um, I have also made it double-sided so that you're able to add notes on both sides if you run out of space, because I would like you to get down as much detail as possible. But how all these different institutions that form part of the British Parliament operate and work together. So just briefly, just to give you an outline of the structure of Parliament, um, the rules of how Parliament actually work are set out in what's known as a constitution. Um, and this is a really important set of documents and laws that basically lays out how, who has the power to do what in Britain and how society and the state should be organised. Um, so that's the sort of overarching set of rules that governs Parliament, if you like. Um, Parliament itself is formed of three parts. The House of Commons and the House of Lords, I'm sure you've already heard of, um, but not many people remember that the monarchy still forms part of the House of um, Parliament as well. Um, you also have the core executive, which includes the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, and this is sometimes called the Government. Um, the core executive is formed from the House of Commons and is generally made up of MPs from the most powerful party, uh, generally the party with the majority of seats. Um, the core executive is very important as they tend to introduce and create most of the laws that get passed through the House of Parliament. You also have the Supreme Court, um, which is responsible for making sure that the government acts lawfully and that Parliament's laws are lawful in the sense that they don't challenge the Constitution. Um, the Supreme Court's main role, I suppose, is to scrutinise uh, the work of Parliament and the government. And finally, you've got to consider the role of the European Union. Um, many of the laws made by the European Union now, Union now apply to Britain and our Parliament. And the example that we're going to be talking about in this lecture is the Human Rights Act of 1998, which I'm sure some of you have come across lower down in the school, and possibly from some of the readings you've done around the subject. Uh, the final source of scrutiny is from committees, and these are generally formed of mixtures of lords, from the House of Lords and MPs, and they scrutinise legislation made by the government. Uh, legislation is another word for uh, lawmaking, if you like and hold government officials and department to account. So, the British Constitution. Um, the most basic definition of a constitution is a set of rules which sets out how sovereign power is shared between the government, parliament, the monarchy, and the people. Sorry, that should say. Um, sovereign power is a concept that you'll have looked at in uh, the second slide. Uh, essentially, sovereign power is the amount of power a, a nation, a sovereign state has, and how that uh, power is spread out it, amongst the government, parliament, monarchy and the people is uh, governed by the British constitution. It outlines the process by which laws are formed between the government and the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and finally the role of the monarchy. It's also responsible for limiting the power of the monarchy, um, which is something that we will look at. Um, it sets out when elections should be held, at not a specific date, but it gives um, them a, a limit, uh, sorry, a minimum and a maximum number of years that needs to pass before the election needs to be called. Um, outlines how the government should be formed and what powers it has, so that's similar to the core executive. And it also outlines how to share power um, with both the EU, which, if you like, is a transnational organisation above us, and devolved institutions such as local government and national assemblies, so that's devolved downwards. And that's quite a complicated area of politics, and particularly in how you decide who's got the more power over particular issues. Um, something you need to know about the British Constitution is that it's what's called uncodified. Um, this used to be unwritten, but uncodified is probably a, a better term to use. Uh, this means basically that it doesn't exist in a single document, like the American codified constitution, which is on a single document. Um, but actually, our constitution is formed of a number of different sources and laws that have been passed over time. Um, 
Many would say this actually makes reforms much easier in our country. So uh, just if we think about how to compare this with America, can you guys think of any particular law in America that can't be changed because it's part of the American Constitution? And to us, this law can sometimes seem a little bit ridiculous. Um, And that's because of its codified constitution. However, we can be much more flexible because ours is uncodified. So when I, we talk about the House of um, Parliament, it's divided into two distinct parts. You have the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, the House of Commons is known for its green seats, and the House of Lords is known for its red seats. Uh, I've been very cunning with my colour of font here, I'm sure you'll say. Uh, so the House of Commons is divided into two sides, generally. Um, it encourages uh, this sort of approach. You've got the majority, uh, the party with the most MPs, And you have the opposition, which is what's left over. And that can be one party or several parties with um, a few members. Um, So currently, our opposition would be Labour, the Scottish National Party, some of the UKIP members, uh, Green Party, and maybe one or two independents. Um, The government, um, the ministers and prime minister, is also picked from the Commons. And the House of Commons has three main jobs. The first one, most common, is representation. Uh, The Commons is made up of 650 members of Parliament, and there are 650 seats in Parliament, um, and they represent the 650 different local constituencies around the country. Um, So can you pause this lecture now and have a quick look at who your local member of Parliament is? Um, Just to give you a hint, your constituency is Wealdon. The idea behind this was to keep politics localised, to keep the interests of local people um, represented up in um, Parliament in Westminster in London. However, the system has been criticised, what they call call low resemblance. Uh, And when we look at the makeup of the House of Commons, uh, which you might do with Mr Carter as well, you find that it's predominantly male, Uh, mainly white and largely middle class. So many people say this isn't actually a true representation of the diversity of the British population. So how can these MPs make laws when they don't actually represent the rest of the population? Its second uh, function is legislation, basically the process of making laws. Um, It's worth mentioning that most laws do actually start in the Commons, um, but must also be passed by the Lords in order to, to make it a law. Um, This is unless the Parliament Act is invoked. Um, So I'd like you to pause again here and quickly Google what is the Parliament Act. Uh, There are two parts of it, the uh, 1911 and 1949. But what's the gist of the Parliament Act? And finally, the role of the House of Commons is scrutiny to keep an eye on the government. Now, even though the government gets formed from the House of Commons, um, it is still the House of Commons' job to make sure that they do their job properly, uh, they don't take advantage of their power, and uh, they do this through committees, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, and also something called Prime Minister's Questions, which we'll look at in class as well. House of Lords um, is uh, formed of what's called peers. Um, Peers are lords. Uh, They are unelected and they're appointed by the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's government. Now, this has led to many people arguing that this is actually very anti-democratic because there is no link between peers and the British public. There are also 24 um, bishops and archbishops on the House of Lords, also appointed by the government. Uh, And all peers tend to come from a political party background, but they can also be industry experts. So, for example, Alan Sugar was made a life peer by Labour by Tony Blair because of his expertise with business uh, businesses and business startups and whatnot. Um, Lords are life peers; they're they're lords for life. Um, But because they don't actually need to be elected, party ties are relatively weak. That's the wrong spelling of weak. Apologies. Uh, So, for example, again, Alan Sugar um, actually left the Labour Party just before the past election. Um, He decided he didn't feel that he had anything in common with the policies under Ed Miliband and left. But he's still a life peer in the House of Lords, but he's just no longer associated with the Labour Party. Um, Interestingly, the Prime Minister can pick peers to be on the government to form part of the Cabinet, if you like. 
And that links back to the anti-democratic point because these people are not directly elected and yet they can end up on one of the most powerful institutions within Parliament. Um, so hopefully some of you found this out already. Uh, but the Parliament Act gives the Commons the final say on bills. Um, this means that if an Act goes from the House of Commons to the House of Lords and the House of Lords says no, um, the, ha the House of Commons uh, can take it back. They can amend it if they want, but they don't have to. Uh, because the Lords can only delay a bill for one session or one year of Parliament, if you like. Once that time's passed, um, the House of Lords has to allow it to pass. Um, the Parliament Act also brought in the convention that the House of Lords can't amend or veto money bills, anything to do with money. The Lords can introduce bills, but their main job is to scrutinise House of Commons bills. Uh, and when you think about the resemblance point for the House of Commons, it's even weaker for the House of Lords. So the House of Lords is arguably even more unrepresentative of the general public than the House of Commons, which is something that's worth um, challenging. Um, once uh, a bill passes both houses, uh, they are signed by the monarch, the Queen, and they become what's called statute law. Now, there's always some confusion over the terminology around the government and the executive. Uh, essentially, the government, uh, which is colloquially referred to in most of the uh, reports, media reports, and probably by myself, is the core executive. And the core executive consists of the cabinet and the prime minister. And I've given you the figures um, of um, the number of ministers that actually exist within our core executive at the moment just there. In total, there is 118 ministers, but only 21 of them are cabinet and 22, including the prime minister. So uh, in the United Kingdom, the prime minister and the cabinet form the core executive and their power is fused together. So there's no separation. Uh, it's, the core executive is the most powerful part of Parliament, largely because of its power over legislation and lawmaking. Um, and within that, the Prime Minister is the most powerful part of the core executive um, in setting the agenda, in arranging meeting times, uh, writing the Queen's speech, for example. Following an election, the leader of the party with the most votes becomes Prime Minister. The Queen uh, grants him permission to be Prime Minister and then forms a government. Uh, this is normally someone from the majority party, but sometimes in the case of a coalition, uh, as we've just recently had, you might see that uh, the government makeup reflects the coalitions. You might have some members from other parties. She or he will appoint cabinet ministers to specialise in different departments. So you will have an education minister, you'll have a treasury minister, although that is called the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And below each minister will be a team of other ministers. Um, they are each responsible for policy making and putting it into practice in their departments and they're uh, held accountable for that as well. Now behind all this is something called the civil service, which you may have heard of. And the civil service is essentially a permanent institution in the sense that the people who work there don't change with elections and they're made up of specialists for each government department. Um, and they help the government of the day to develop and implement its policies as they are unelected and in theory they are neutral so they shouldn't have any bias towards the Conservatives, Labour, Liberal, Green or what have you. So... Can you have a quick think of why you think it might be important to actually have permanent specialists in place to help make policy in each government department? What's the benefit of doing that? Because it can, to some, appear a bit undemocratic, but what's the, what's the pro of having that system in place? While Parliament might be responsible for making laws, uh, generally it's the judiciary... Uh, respond, that's responsible for applying and implementing many of these laws, particularly those around civil law and criminal law. Um, but that's not the extent of their role in Parliament. There are two highest levels of courts in the UK. It's the Appeals Court, and above that you have the Supreme Court. Uh, and they are generally concerned with clarifying the meaning and the application of laws. So can you pause here and see if you can find any examples of where the Supreme Court or the Appeals Court has had to examine uh, a new government law, and can you find out why? The Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. Um, 
One of the areas that you need to be aware of is the reform to the Supreme Court that's happened in the past um, five years or so. The Supreme Court used to be based within the House of Lords and was formed of what was called 12 law lords. Um, these law lords were appointed by the government, generally by the Chancellor. However, they've now been moved into a completely separate building, so they're no longer in the House of Lords. And the justices, as they're called, no longer called law lords, um, they st that sit on the Supreme Court are no longer members of the House of Lords. They are separate um, they are also appointed by a separate commission now, no longer appointed by the government. Now, this was all very important, as it was seen as key in ensuring their neutrality and independence from politics. So why do you think it's important for the judiciary, the Supreme Court and the Appeals Court, why do you think it's important for this court in particular to appear like it's neutral and independent from politics? So just to summarise their main jobs, one of them is judicial review. So this is when they actually closely examine or scrutinise uh, the actions and laws, ma laws made by Parliament. And they determine if they go beyond the scope of power granted to them. This is what's known as ultra-virus, which you should have come across in the concepts that we went through at the very beginning of this lecture. So this is all key in making sure that um, Parliament is held to account and that the laws they made are scrutinised. A more complicated part of their role is to dissolve, resolve disputes between the UK National Parliament and the devolved governments of Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland. And finally, this role has probably become a little bit more important in more recent years. They are responsible for examining British laws and seeing if they are incompatible with British laws. Uh, and that's when they make a declaration of incompatibility. And a good example of that, again, which we'll come to a bit towards the end of this lecture, is the Human Rights Act that was signed in in 1998. There are 12 Supreme Court judges, uh, an example of one there on the left. And um, as I mentioned, they are in a separate building to the Lords. So while the judiciary might be completely separate to the House of Parliament now, um, there are also controls within Parliament in order to make sure the government is held to account, largely through the practice of committees. Um, and this is all part of the scrutiny element of uh, Parliament's job, particularly the House of Commons, in order to make sure the government doesn't overstep its boundary in terms of what it's allowed to do with its sovereign power. Um, there are two different types of committees. There are standing committees um, that are formed of members of Parliament, and they scrutinise each part of a bill in great detail to make sure it's workable. All bills need to go through the stage before they can become legislation. Now, this is really important for particularly reforms to welfare bills and education bills, which will affect you guys on a day-to-day -day basis. Because, for example, it might all be well and good saying, oh, we need to reduce welfare. However, how you actually work that into a workable policy that doesn't cause complete chaos, for example, is something that needs great scrutiny and consideration. And that's what standing committees are for. The other type of committee uh, is known as a select committee. Um, this is much more about holding government departments to account. Okay? Uh, they will examine the work of different ministerial departments, so they'll have a select committee for the education department. Uh, they might look at some of the policies that they've made and how, in a, if they've been ineffectually implemented, they might uh, hold a committee and uh, talk to the, well, examine, I suppose, the, the Minister of Education. Um, and there are also non-departmental select committees that can look into the work of more than one department. And probably the most famous of these is the Public Accounts Committee that we will look at in more detail. These make sure that departments keep to account for their spending in particular. Um, so the Public Accounts Committee has quite a lot to say over things like HS2, the train line, and the spending implications of that. Um, but this is something we will go into more detail in lessons uh, later on this term. Now, as I mentioned towards the beginning of this lecture, the monarchy can sometimes be neglected when thinking about the role of Parliament. And that's largely because the monarch's role in Parliament has become pretty much a rubber stamp role. Uh, what we'd like to say, or she's like a figurehead, if you like. Um, so, in terms of the monarchy's responsibility, 
Um, the Queen is still responsible for the state opening of Parliament. She goes to Parliament once a year to open it after their recess, if you like, which is a bit like their summer holidays. And this is where she'll make her squeen, the Queen's speech sorry, uh, in the House of Lords. Now, the reason uh, she has to go to the House of Lords is because the Queen's not actually allowed in the House of Commons. Um, and in order to hear her speech, the members of Parliament from the House of Commons have to come into the House of Lords. So it's the only occasion in Parliament where all three branches of Parliament come together under one roof to listen to the Queen's speech. Um, this is really important, the Queen's speech, because this is where she'll outline the plan for the government for the whole year. And generally, anything mentioned in the Queen's speech uh, is, is generally passed that year. So it's quite a significant speech. However, the Queen, of course, does not write this speech. Um, the Prime Minister and the government will tell her what needs to be said, if you like. Um, she has given some flexibility, but not very much at all. Uh, in addition to the state opening of Parliament, uh, the Queen also has to give her royal assent to the bills passed by both houses um, and those subject to the Act of Parliament. So even if the Lords don't want to pass it, because of the Act of Parliament, she can give her uh, royal assent to those bills. And this is when it becomes a law. Um, it is worth having doing a bit of research now about the last time a monarch actually withheld their assent because it's not normally done. So there was something that happened in 1914. Uh, can you find out what bill it was and why that monarch didn't want to sign it? Okay, so there's different to with, withholding, withholding and refusing. They only withheld in that case. I think the last time a monarch refused to sign a bill was about 300 years ago. Um, the Prime Minister also still needs the Queen's permission to form a new government following an election, and it's also conventional for the Queen to remain politically neutral. So maybe you could annotate onto your A3 sheet. Why do you think it's important for the monarch to not show favour to one political party or another? Finally, um, you can't quite understand the workings of our Parliament, and particularly the role of the Supreme Court in our Parliament, unless you have an idea of the context that we, we, we exist in, which is as a member of the European Union. Um, and I'm, I'm fairly certain that uh, most of you have heard of the European Union and have an idea of some of its implications. So I thought I'd give you a very brief history lesson on it um, before we talk about it in more detail in class. So the European Union wasn't always known as the EU. It was first formed as what's known as the ECC, uh, the European, sorry, the EEC, the European Economic Community, uh, which had two main roles, to prevent war in Europe and also to create economic stability through mutual trade. Um, it became more of a political and social union in 1992, uh, where the free movement of people, capital and products was essentially introduced, and also the idea of Europe-wide rights, so that any European citizen had the same rights regardless of what European country they were living in. This kind of meant that there had to be some sort of institution to enforce these rights. Um, so, the European Union, Union at this stage had some authority over justice and laws in the UK. So, this had huge implications to the idea of um, sovereign power. It was no longer at all at all the British people's power. The European Union took some of it, if you like. So, in 1998, we signed into the UK law the Human Rights Act. Um, and I'm sure you've heard of this because quite a lot of cases get brought in front of the Supreme Court where people use the Human Rights Act to challenge uh, particular laws that they deem as unfair for a range of reasons. And the most famous cases that go up um, time and time again are those are for euthanasia. Um, so a euthanasia is essentially the idea that someone who is in a lot of pain or is suffering should be allowed to die, whether they kill themselves or a doctor might give them a lethal concussion of drugs, for example, for them to pass away quite peacefully and painlessly. Um, this has been challenged under the, the um, inhumane and degrading treatment aspect um, of the European Convention on Human Rights, um, Article 3. Uh, it's yet to be passed in Britain, but it has been passed in other countries. Um, so similar cases like that do pop up quite often and we will, be, we will be examining some of them in class. Finally, 
It is worth mentioning that we do elect members of the European Parliament, MEPs, every five years. So one of the criticisms of the European Union is that it's very undemocratic because we as the people feel we have very little influence over what laws get made and implemented. But we do actually elect MEPs every five years. So that should form part of your evaluation of that as an institution. Okay. Thank you for listening, Year 12. I'll see you in class.